Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Didn't see any geese this morning, so I think summer's coming back. <laughs> the forecast is very good for the, for the next coming week, so um, we'll enjoy God's grace and his blessings. So, a few notices this week. Uh, the start of the evening services at the parish hall at six o'clock this evening, and Ian will be taking us through the life of Abraham. So do come along in the parish hall at six o'clock um, as we go into the autumn season. Alpha starts on Tuesday at 6.45. So if you know of anybody who is still asking questions and wondering, do encourage them to come along to the Alpha course, even if it's only for a couple of, couple of sessions, just to get them interested, just to answer some questions. And Trish Purchase's funeral will be at 12.45 on Wednesday, so all are welcome. And the last thing is the final concert for this year on Thursday is Fumi Otsuki and Gisela Maya, um, violinist and accompanist. Tickets are still available and you can buy them at the tea room or on the door. And we will now have a short period of silence and reflection before our service begins. Thank you.
in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning, and it's lovely to see you this morning. I will say autumn had arrived when I left home this morning, very early, to come for eight o'clock. As I drove to the top of Titchfield Hill, the mist sitting over the river below, I was looking over, so I know that summer's officially over and autumn's here. I don't know what the calendar says, but that's what the weather was telling me. So it's good to have sunshine again today on this Sunday when we come to worship. And we begin as we sit for our prayer of preparation. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in word and sacrament, let us call to mind and confess our sins. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen.
our collect for this, the 16th Sunday of Trinity, we pray. Lord of creation, whose glory is around and within us, open our eyes to your wonders, that we may serve you with reverence and know your peace at our life's end. Amen. A reading from the book of Proverbs. Wisdom cries out in the street. In the squares she raises her voice. At the busiest corner she cries out. At the in entrance of the city gates she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools have knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded, and because you have ignored, all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you. When panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices, for waywardness kills the simple and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread of disaster. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the tongue is placed among our members as a word of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of bird and beast, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing, my brothers and sisters. 
This ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grape vine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
O God, make your word a swift word, passing from the ear to the heart, and from the heart to the life, that it may accomplish that for which it is given. Amen. And the Lord said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. When Christians have the devil in them. I don't know if you believe in a literal supernatural being called Satan or the devil. Perhaps you feel that these ideas are simply medieval superstition and that we have grown out of them. Well, Jesus certainly believed in a literal devil, an evil, intelligent being who dogged his every step, overshadowed his every move, and was always trying to trip him up with the intention of thwarting his mission. John Broadhurst, a Church of England bishop, admitted that for most of his ministry, he did not believe in an actual devil, but took the traditional liberal line that the devil was simply a symbolism for evil. But at a public meeting at Church House, Westminster, the headquarters of the Church of England, He told his audience that he had changed his views and believed that there was such a literal being as the devil or Satan. But what shocked his hearers even more once they discovered that a bishop actually believed in these things, what shocked them even more was that he believed that the devil was busy at work There, in Church House, (laughs) the headquarters of the Church of England. What a thing for a bishop to say. Oh! Now, those who heard him thought he was maybe referring to someone he just did not like. (laughs) And so asked him privately who it was he was getting at. But he said he wasn't getting at anyone He gave as an example the tons of paperwork, the miles of red tape, the self-obsessed bureaucracy, which he says distracts the church from its task. Adding, if that is not a good example of Satan's work, I don't know what is. So here is the devil thwarting Jesus from his mission. Here is John Broadhurst speaking of distracting the church from its task. Now, even if you don't believe in the devil, hold on just a sec. Let's call it then something else, just for a moment. Let's call it the dark side, okay? And interpret what that could mean in our lives and in our churches. Because every one of us has the potential to sometimes be on the dark side. This does not mean that we are bad people, nor does it mean that we are on the dark side for most of the time, but sometimes, in a moment of unguarded weakness, we can find that we are being used. We are being used negatively and destructively. And the main way in which Christians sometimes find themselves on the dark side, or if you like, being used by the devil, I refer you to our epistle reading from James. It's with our tongue. It's the words we say. Just think of how many churches have been thwarted in their ministry and sidetracked in their mission 
because of things that people have said. Think how many people have left churches because of things people have said. Think of how many clergy have resigned from their ministry because of words spoken, unkind things said, and sometimes from very surprising sources. Yes, we all have the potential at times to be on the dark side and to find that our tongue is being used in a destructive a negative way to thwart people's growth of the mission of the church. Now, don't think that you are above this, that you are far too holy and spiritual, that you could never be used in this way. Because Jesus, in our gospel reading, has just called Peter, the apostle Peter, he has just called him the devil. What a nice thing to say. He has just called him because he said to him, get behind me, Satan. He calls Peter Satan. Now, I don't think Jesus was jesting or exaggerating to make a point or even just saying this in the spur of the moment anger because everyone at that time took the devil's existence very seriously. Jesus was not saying that Peter was a bad person. In fact, Peter was one of his closest friends, a committed disciple, an effective apostle, and one being trained for the future leadership of the church. It's just on that occasion he found himself on the dark side and was being used to try and divert Jesus from following the path he was meant to take. Again, as an example of that, how Christian people have the potential to be used, sometimes in a negative and destructive way, we read from our epistle of James, where he says that with the same tongue we bless the Lord. In other words, we come to church and sing our hymns. And then, he says, with the same tongue, we curse our brother and sister. One minute singing hymns to God, the next minute at the end of the service speaking evil of and sometimes to one another. And so James says, brothers and sisters, this not ought to be. But sadly, so often it is the case. Then James goes on to say that the untamed tongue has the potential to destroy a church. He says, how great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. So coming back to Peter again in the gospel, Peter was a great disciple, make no doubt about it, a committed, zealous Christian follower of Jesus. But like all of us, there were flaws in his character, which at times can come to the surface. For a start, he suffered from foot and mouth disease, which means that most time when he speaks, he tends to put his foot in it. Peter was rather impulsive. He didn't think through issues enough. He didn't weigh up the cost or the implications. He spoke as he felt. And often, He said the wrong thing at the wrong time. He's a bit of a big shot, Peter. He's full of self-confidence. I will never deny you, Lord, he once said. He promises much, but he can't deliver. He lets people down. He can't be depended on. He didn't tend to reflect much before speaking. And so we read in the gospel, then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. But impulsive Peter does not hear the next bit. 
and be raised on the third day. You see, Peter is a man with his own agenda. He knows even better than Jesus does what is best for Jesus. So when our Lord says that his way to bring about the Father's purposes would be through the way of the cross, this does not fit in with Peter's agenda, what Peter wants. Peter has a totally different agenda for Jesus. Peter doesn't want a God who suffers, rejects, and is killed. Peter needs a strong God, like many of his day, looking for a descendant of mighty King David to come down and overthrow the Roman rule and restore Israel to its rightful place among the nations. Jesus has to be that person in Peter's thinking. After all, this Jesus has already brought relief, comfort, healing, and life. So what's all this talk about suffering and death? But that was what he wanted. What did God want for Jesus? That didn't seem to figure at the moment. Peter wants a strong God. And who can blame him? And are we any different? When the crushing weight of hardship bears down on us, when the voices of despair drown out all other voices, when it's one disappointment after another, don't we also want a strong God to avenge our hearts, to right all wrongs, to put us back on the top of things? And so often the negative things that we say and do about other people comes from the very same principle, people have let us down. They have failed us. They have not come up to our expectations. We live with the imperfections of our own lives, but we cannot tolerate the imperfections in the lives of others. And so we need to take up our cross by embracing our sinful selves, accepting our limitations, and begin to accept the limitations of one another who still want to follow Christ and do what he wants to do. So just some final thoughts. What can I do, therefore, about this so that I do not become a tool of the dark side to thwart the purposes of God in this church and in people's lives. Well, we can try and become more reflective people, even in conversations. We can take a little time to react, to reflect on what was said or what is happening in the church or wherever it is. And we can use the grace of self-discipline to control our tongue. And in that time of reflecting, we need to say to ourselves, is this simply my preference? Or is this God's will for the church, for the mission, for the purposes? And then we need to know the mind of Christ. We need to know the mind of Christ by being often in his word and letting his word sink into our soul so that we begin to think as he thinks. We need to be more in the presence of Christ in prayer so that we sense what he is saying. Remember the little wristband that some people had, WWJD, what would Jesus do? We need another one, maybe, what would Jesus say? So, to calm your fears and worries, as people came up to the end to Bishop John and said, who were you getting at? <laughs> Why do people always think we preachers are getting at people? <laughs> be assured, be assured, I am not getting at anybody. But be warned, every one of us have the potential at times to be used on the dark side. So let instead 
pray that God will use us to speak blessing and positive things and to understand his will for our lives, for the church, and for one another. To his glory and praise. Amen. So we stand to confess the faith of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. The message for today's prayers is about relationships, love, and forgiveness. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers and listen to the words as we lay before you your throne, our hopes and fears, our joys and concerns, and all the things for which we give thanks. Help us to respect the beliefs of others, even if we do not share them, to celebrate what we have in common and to accept our differences. Help us always to practice unselfishness as we try to be the servant of all as our Lord commanded. We pray for all people who seek to follow your way in their lives. Let your church speak your words of truth with confidence and in unity so that those who are searching and listening will be able to see and hear clearly your message of love and peace. In your mercy, Creator God, we recognize our part in the tensions and injustice of the world. Heal the resentment between people and 
intervene in the world's conflicts. Help us to walk humbly with you at your side and lead us to the path of justice and righteousness while steering us away from selfishness and sin. We thank you for the love we share with our families and friends. Help us to be flexible and adaptable in all our relationships and capable of accepting constructive criticism. Loving God, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, so that in your power and love, we might also have the gift of eternal life. Bless those whom we love that have departed this life with the gift of your all-encompassing love and life eternal. Lord, we ask you to lead us into the coming week. Help us to believe that you are close by us. Keep us from making mistakes and help us never to disappoint you. When we face hard decisions or difficult work, when we enjoy ourselves and have fun with others, may we know that you'll share these times with us. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, look down on your church and grant us, your people, the grace to desire you with all our hearts, so that desiring you we might seek and find you, and so finding you might love you, and so loving you we might turn away from all that which separates us from you. Faithful God, as we leave this place today and return to our homes and to our loved ones, draw near to us, strengthen our faith, deepen our love for you and for our neighbours, and open our eyes to the wonder of your creation. Spirit of God, your peace is for all, for you are at work in every heart, seen or unseen, recognised or unrecognised, striving to break down the, bar the barriers that keep us from one another and from you. We thank you for your ability to change lives, to transform even the most unlikely people, for giving strength to the weak, hope to the oppressed, freedom to those help captive and healing the sick. Today we pray for all in our world who hunger for peace, all who are tormented by faith, by fear rather, those torn by doubt, those troubled by anxieties or tortured by guilt, families separated by feuds, communities wracked by division and those nations ravaged by war. Loving God, help us to decide wisely, seeking your will and responding to your guidance. Help us to remember that when we go astray, that you are always there to help us start again. We ask that you gather these concerns and all who are in need into your abundant care, remembering your promise of mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We stand if we are able. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. 
and also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, Blessed be God, God forever. forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed, Blessed be, be God, God forever. forever. The Lord is here. His spirit, His spirit is with us. us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and
Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ is the bread of life. Remember. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this our sacrifice of thanks and praise we bring before you this bread and this cup and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you send the holy spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of saint mary and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in this sign. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Lord I, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love is the fulfilling of the law. Grant that we may love you with our whole heart and our neighbours as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And together say, Strengthen for service, O Lord, the hands that have taken holy things. May the ears that have heard your word be deaf to clamour and dispute. May the tongues that have sung your praise be free from deceit. May the eyes that have seen the tokens of your love shine with the light of hope. And may the bodies which have been fed with your body be replenished, be replenished with, with the fullness of your life. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn, Name of All Majesty. The Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.